Rabbit hole friends, we're here with part two of Grant Amato's interrogation. In part one, we learned a lot about how Grant sees the world around him and the fact that we are over two hours into this interrogation and he still hasn't asked why he's there, why the police picked him up and what they're questioning him about. So things are really starting to look like something is very wrong. Part of the interrogation, we hear a lot about Grant's life at home and how he feels about his father. This is a really important part of what we need to look at because the upcoming docu-series is going to bring out more questions about what was going on in the Amato home. Allegedly, Grant is going to make accusations that his father was very abusive and inappropriate with everyone in the home. So let's take a look at all of that right now. But then, I mean, I know for me, I had been bummed out just because, like, I've been out of work. I've, you know, my whole life it's been school, work, school, back to work, and then just, I mean, that's it. You know? Welcome to the real world, Grant. Welcome to adulthood. That's what most of life is like. And we're living in a century where things are a lot easier for us. Imagine like before there was electricity and gaming, my friend, get over it. Um, what we do hear a lot of in this part of the interrogation is evidence that Grant was severely depressed. He was dealing with depression. And I don't understand why, I mean, who knows? We don't know everything about what was happening in the home, but it sounds like he wasn't getting any help for it. We're gonna hear him talk about why he's not using any medication or anything like that as the interview goes on. You know, I sacrificed all my 20s and never went tailgating or anything like that. Do you have any issues with depression over all the legal issues and, and beyond? I, I would say that I was depressed, but, um, you know, I'd always put on, the, put on the happy face for like my brother. And how, how, how would you deal with the depression? You know, I I talk to God. Uh, I try and just rationalize it in my head that you know, I haven't heard anything from this attorney in five months, six months. That, I mean, you'd think that if it was something so severe that you would have heard about it by now. Um, so I was just trying to rationalize to myself that hopefully this can all get taken care of, and then I can get back. I was looking towards the future. You know, like then I can do like what I'm doing now, where applying. You know. Everybody likes me when they talk to me and they look at my resume and they see all my experience and then just waiting for if I get the call back. Well, you, 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 got, you know, of course, I'm sure you know this. You've got that little blemish yeah. over no fault of yours that goes away, but still it's there. They can see it. Right, right. And you have to explain away. Right. Here. Even though it was dropped, you still have that, that little check right. mark that they, you've got to get by. Right. And then that's, that's tough to, to be go from what you were and you're working towards you know, the job your, your brother has right. and, you know, the financial gains, you know, the difference between being a nurse and the program you're going to, it's, 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 it's a huge burden on you, of course. Yeah. Again, the police are just being like, wow, sounds like you have a lot of reason to be super jealous of your older brother who we just found murdered <laughs> in the home of your family. Um, I don't, it makes no sense why Grant's still hasn't picked up on all of this. I mean, I think, once again, I think he has. I think he knows no other way to deal with it other than to pretend that nothing's wrong. And he has no idea, like, just normal to be called into the police station and be questioned like this. Um, still doesn't need to know what he's here for. Yeah. Ever take any medication for the depression? No, no, never. I never took any, uh, like, Or even self-medicate? No, I never took any, like, antidepressants or anything like that. I think um, the only thing, just because, like, sleeping was kind of off and on at a time, I would take like um, um, like Benadryl just to like help me go to sleep back at home, and then when um, I think the only other thing is like sleep aid, which is again it's just mm -hmm. diphenhydramine. You know, secondary side effect is just drowsiness. It's not like its actual purpose. And then melatonin just to help with the sleep cycle because I work nights all the time, so I was always a night owl, always awake. And then now it's like trying to get back in trying to because yeah, I'd be going to days. Um, but that's the only thing I ever took, and then Advil, ibuprofen. Okay, so even these police officers who barely know Grant are like, wow, sounds like things are pretty rough right now. Are you taking any, like, antidepressant or anything like that? And he's like, no, no, I don't need any of that. Um, clearly in denial, clearly totally out of the loop when it comes to, like, how deep 
down a hole. His whole life appears to have taken this like horrible turn and he's stuck down in a big hole, right? Um, he needs some help and the police officers can see it right off the bat, but he's like, no. He's just like, also one more thing, although I'm sure it's not important at all, is like, I'm not sleeping. So I do have to take Benadryl sometimes. I'm working night shift, which I know what it's like to work night shift. Um, it really messes with you and not sleeping really messes with your mental health. So we've got a lot going on with this guy. He probably needed, he probably desperately needed intervention. And being that his dad is a pharmacist, he's a nurse, his brother is a CRNA, like, it's really unfortunate that no one said, like, it's okay if you need some help. Let's try to get you some help. I do believe at some point they tried to send him to, um, like, a treatment facility, but that was more for addiction. And I'm not sure, you know, if they were really pushing along the lines of, like, we need to medicate you. We need to, like, fix some issues with your depression and it's not your fault. Uh, there's definitely something going on with this family that uh just in general he's not the only one grant's not the only one who's in denial right um but then he's an adult so at that at the point in time that these murders take place he should have been able to take care of himself and were, were you the baby you just yeah. were truly the family baby for my mom for yeah. The yeah okay for my mom um mom the favorite yeah okay. and i mean i had been being told that because Again, it's like this last six or seven months was just like stressful for everybody. Sure. And, you know, countless times my dad would like come up to me and he'd make like me feel, like he'd try and use things and word things to make me feel guilty so that I would, you know, do everything that I can, like get a job. Almost and, like a motivation. Right. Right. So your dad tried to make you feel guilty. So you would get off of your butt and do something for yourself. He recognized that you were wasting your life away. And maybe he wasn't like super like, oh, my baby, oh, just do what you want. Like be an artist, use all my money. OK, that's not abuse. Right. We get that. From what I understand, Grant is going to broach this subject more in the upcoming documentary that's being released on April 16th in just a couple of days, and he's going to make allegations that his father was pretty abusive to him and that their family was really toxic and that that's all a big part of what happened here. Once again, Grant is also still maintaining his innocence, so that's quite interesting given all of the overwhelming evidence we have against him and the fact that he was living in a totally delusional like fantasy world when all of this happened he's a known liar he's a known um, user and abuser and all of those are facts so it's really difficult to get to a point where we can believe him that he didn't commit this crime uh, and he he'd tell me time and time again that you know you're her favorite I mean she would do anything for you mm -hmm. and I mean, it's like, yeah, I don't need to hear that. I mean, that's not what would motivate me. Sure. Um, but no, with mom, I think we yelled at each other a grand total of like three or four times my whole life. Um, I've never like yelled at her for anything because, I mean, she's never done anything wrong. She's always been the one who's stood by, you. Stood by me, but tried, to, you know, even during our early childhood when it was really rough with our dad. Mm -hmm. uh, Why is that? My dad's a Leo type A, Italian mm -hmm. personality man. He's very focused on his future. Mm -hmm. um, he's very focused on everything that he's sacrificed in his life. Okay, this is interesting to me because Grant's father is a pretty successful pharmacist, but here Grant is going to talk about a time when his dad actually got fired from a job for quote unquote being an asshole. Um, I was able to obtain a lot of stuff from social media about Grant's dad. He actually put this like online resume up that I found really interesting. Um, definitely Grant's dad, Chad Amato. From a distance, knowing what little I know, he rubs me the wrong way. I think something is off about him. I, I definitely could foresee that this was a home full of anxiety that his dad wanted to be the best and then expected everyone around him to be doing their best and being the best. I can see that maybe there were some issues with OCD, which is something that we're going to come across like further along into this investigation. Um, but there's definitely something going on with Chad. For the better, betterment of all of us. Um, 
you know, like he's always dreamed of going hiking up in the mountains. They have a property up in Tennessee that they built. And I've actually, me and Cody and Jason have never been up to that house just because mom and dad hide that from you. That's our, our secret hideaway. A little bit. No a kids little allowed. A little bit, but I mean, they. <laughs> have you seen a picture of it? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of place is it? Um, it's nice. It's like I think my dad has emphasized that it's about half the size of the, the house out in Juliana where we all grew up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's I mean super modern. It's got like the brick layout on the whole thing. It's Okay, this part I just left in to talk about how the Amato family, like, they have money. Here we have Grant talking about how they have a second house and his dad goes out there to, like, work on it and fix it up. And it's not as big as, like, the 4,000 square foot home they live in, like their central home. But it's really nice. Um, So this is a family who's done well for themselves. They're pretty successful. I think he also talks about how his grandfather was a pharmacist as well. They have money. um, And... There's a, a big part of their social media presence is like a lot of pictures of them taking care of, riding, and like training horses. So that requires a fair amount of cash and investment. Um, we can see that these people are successful. And I think that has an influence on a lot of what Grant is doing here. Like the fact that he spent $200,000 on a cam girl and most of us would be like, oh my God, like I can't believe it. He's just on such a different level. I mean, one of the reasons is because he has mental health issues. Another reason is because he's quite spoiled. But I think the third reason is, like, he does see his family spending a lot of money. They have means. And he thinks that he should be able to live like he has means. Okay. Tell me about Dad. Dad. Uh, what does he do? What does he do? Dad's a pharmacist. Okay. Uh, he works for CVS. He's been a pharmacist for, I think, 35 years or so. Well, he worked for CVS? No, he uh, he worked for the hospital, ORMC, actually, or I think it was something orange back in the day. But um, he worked for ORMC for about 15 years, and then he worked with Home Infusion with Ambient Healthcare for, like, 11 years or 13 years. Mm-hmm. He tr- when because uh, he was fired mm-hmm. from, oh, sorry, and then he was, uh, like IV home infusion with Florida Hospitals mm-hmm. home infusion group for only about two or three years. Mm-hmm. Um, he was fired from that for being like I guess to not like soft but like an asshole because mm-hmm. uh, he would like like his manager or something was this like young woman and then she was giving him crap and then he's like I've been a pharmacist for this many years like I don't and you're younger than it's like I don't have to listen to you you know. So I guess he blew up one day when he was down at work, and then um, because of that, he ended up getting fired, and then he was out of work for about three months. And then he was trying to get back into the hospital system, trying to do home infusion again. Mm -hmm. But because of how old he is, and because he has an RPH degree, which was the original pharmacist. Who was the disciplinary in the family? My dad. And was he the one that decided Jason stays yes. locked in? Yeah. What did mom think about that? Mom didn't approve of it, obviously, but back in that time, my dad was a very, like, angry, violent type person. Overbearing? Overbearing. Okay, one, here Grant is talking about Jason. Jason is the eldest brother. He's the half-brother to Grant and Cody. And, you know, Grant is letting us know that Jason had a hard time in the home. He didn't get along very well with Chad. They bumped heads a lot of the time. And that Grant always saw his dad, Chad, as, like, the major disciplinarian in this family. And this is the first time we really hear... And one of the only times we really hear Grant talk about his idea that Chad was kind of violent at times. He even says that Chad was violent towards his mom. And I think we're going to be hearing a lot more of this in the upcoming docu-series. Um, you know, he would, he would like, push my mom. And, like, one instance, you know, it was getting to that age where me and Cody were kind of getting old enough to maybe be able to do something if she needed our help. And uh, I remember... Her and my dad were like in their room, which if you go down the stairs, it's right there to the left. Um, we heard our mom yell that he's hurting me, he's hurting me, and then me and Cody run downstairs and we go into the room, and then we're trying to get our dad off of our mom, and then my dad elbows back, and that's why my nose has got its little like bridge mm-hmm. right there. Um, but I mean, that's like how he was, like spankings with a two by four. Um, you know, like baseball practice, it'd be like four or five hours, and he's 
hurling the ball as fast as an adult can, and we're like seventh to eighth grade trying to catch this stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, definitely very overbearing, but he would always rationalize that he's just trying to like secure our future. Violent towards the family. Violent towards my mom and towards me. Never to Co and, and towards Jason, uh, but never to Cody. Why? Um, I, don't, I mean, Cody, his favorite. Yeah, of I mean, three boys. Yeah, and with that, I mean, I could kind of see it, but Cody also never really made any mistakes. He he did a few things wrong. He lied a few times. You know, he cost my dad some money a few times, but he was never like a repeat offender, I guess you could say. Whereas me and Jason. You know, we had that difficulty where it's like, okay, we got a C or we got a D on something, and I just don't want to tell Dad about it. Sure. But then he would find out, and then, you know. Dad ever abused you? When we were younger. Um, How so? Spankings with, like, a 2 by 4 and then, you know, he'd, he'd use, like, uh, I mean, it was like a 2 by 4 that was fashioned into a paddle called the lightning, the, the, the lightning rod, I think is what it was Don't called. No, he, he broke it on me. Uh, I'd be sorry. I would, I would probably say it was my dad take it out and burn it. Yeah, so he didn't have it anymore. But um, yeah, he would um, yeah, he'd do that, and then he'd push you around. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't punch you. He wouldn't bruise you. Slap you? He never slapped me. But I guess I should say the only place that I ever got bruised was on my butt from from being spanked. Belittle you? He would belittle me when I was younger. But again, since you've been out of work. Um. No, I mean, not really. He would just make me feel bad that, like, he would make me feel bad that Cody's doing all this stuff to, like, um... And you're not. And I'm not. Like, I'm not contributing. You're not as, not as valuable, maybe. Right. Maybe that's not the right word, but you're, you're not, you're not, like you said, contributing enough to what needs to be done. Right, and then, um, But nobody knows better than you that you want to be out, but right. you want to have it. And I mean, I, the problem, I guess, was, was that I was... I was always like the the jokester, the one that could calm everybody down, make everybody smile. If it was a heated situation, I could say a joke or something and then make everybody kind of move past it. And I was just in the point where it's like, you know, I'm hearing, you know, all this stuff from dad, I'm seeing how much Cody's helping me, you know, mom's stressed out with her job and it's like I'm not doing anything. And it's like I'm in that situation where it's like I'm not not doing something because I don't want to. I'm held out because I'm waiting for this whole legal thing to get taken care of and then for jobs. Okay, this is just my opinion. Others may disagree with me. But what Grant describes here as being like the difficult times he has with his dad just don't seem as bad as what I might expect from him given like the turmoil that's going on in his life. From my point of view, Grant really looks like an F up, like a loser. Um, because, you know, he's been given a lot and we're seeing, I don't know, we're basically seeing, we're seeing that even his outlook on his family, like, isn't that bad. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if he's covering up a lot here, if in his state of depression with how blank he is or whatever else is going on with him, whatever is going on with his mental health, that he's not able to open up and talk about like that things were pretty bad in the home. Um, I just find it interesting that he kind of acts like, what was I supposed to do? Like, I can't get a job right now. So I mean, I can't, what am I supposed to do? There's no reason why um, anyone should be angry with me. You know, he's just very um, unable to be realistic about what expectations parents should have at, of an adult son. He's an adult, you know, the fact that he's still living in the home, both of them are still living in the home. There's just something very off about what's going on here. Uh, the last time my dad put his hands on me would be... I'd say kind of the middle of December of 2018. What happened? It's because, um, you know, with all the money that had been getting spent and uh, I guess just the mix of everything that I've been saying just kind of boiling up in him um, and the fact that I was, to him, it seemed like I wasn't concerned about it. So, and then plus I was, you know, I wasn't acting like myself with the jovialness and, you know, sure. all that kind of stuff. Um, 
my father chose to admit me to like a like an, a depression or an addiction clinic or something like that in Fort Lauderdale called Cornerstone. Okay, now we're getting into another very important part of the story that it took two hours for Grant to get to. He's finally going to let the police know that just a couple of weeks ago, his family, specifically his dad, tried to take him to an addiction recovery center called Cornerstone, and he was pissed about it. He did not want to go there. He doesn't think he needs to go. We're going to hear more about that. And he left. He stayed for a very short period of time and left and came home and refused to complete treatment. Um... After I did like the deep dive into what was going on here, I recognized that Chad Amato paid $15,000 for his son to attend this treatment center and he didn't finish treatment. When was that? That was December 22nd. Okay. Until I think uh, January 4th. Did you agree to go? I, I didn't, but they said that, you know, this was your only... Who said? My dad. Okay. And that was in Fort Lauderdale? Yes. Yeah. Did your mom agree to with it? My mom and my brother both agreed, but Maybe. it was Maybe. my dad who was like the iron fist, like, this is what's going to happen. Like, you know, he can't. Why did he say he needed to go? What was his reasoning? Because uh, with the way that I was acting, he just, he didn't see that I was doing anything for, like, the positive. Um, you know, and a lot of it just came back to money uh, with him. Uh, he would... He would, like, allow me to, to spend money that he had, uh, like, with his credit card or something like that, but... Okay, now, finally, we're going to get into it. We're going to actually hear from Grant, like, what's really going on, what the real problem is in the home. And we are still over two hours into this interview, and he still has not asked why he's there. But he's finally going to let the police in on, like, the real toxic issues that are going on in the house. Now... The police already know because they've already spoken to Jason. I think Jason was the first brother that they found that they spoke to, and he's given them like some information about what was happening in the home. This is a big deal. Like what's happening with Grant was a big deal, but Grant kind of makes it like <laughs> just like, you know, there was something going on in the background, like that I stole two hundred thousand dollars from them, but like that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I almost forgot to tell you. I did steal two hundred thousand dollars from everyone. Um, but the police are aware. They're just, like, giving him a chance to tell his side of the story so that they can catch him in some kind of inconsistencies and really be able to use this when it comes time for court. It's like then whenever I did, it was, like, a huge problem. Okay, so you had one of his credit cards. Yeah. And what were you buying with it? Uh, well, what I was doing is um, over the past, four months or something like that. I've been, ta I've been talking to this woman online. Who is she? Uh, she's, it's embarrassing as it is. She's a, she's a, cam, she's a cam model. A what? A cam model. Do you, right. do you guys know that? Nope. Uh, just, just like all the videos, okay. you, gotta, you have to tell us. A cam model, it's like they, they, it's like a virtual girlfriend, I guess you could say. Okay. Like that type of situation. Mm -hmm. So, a lot of the money went to her. Okay. Where's she at? She lives in Bulgaria. Bulgaria. Where's that? It's over in Europe. It's like okay. outside of Germany. Okay. Like that. You ever been there? No. Okay. Um, so it wasn't. It wasn't that serious. Okay. So what would you give her money for? Um, just for like the time online with her. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was just like that type of thing. And what did she charge by the minute, by the hour? Minute. Okay. Yeah. And how much is it per minute? Oh God, I think it was like it was like ninety tokens a minute, and it's like the conversion rate for all of that is. Like six hundred dollars for like a like five thousand or something tokens or something like that. So, and then it was four hours a night. Um, so I mean, it's, I mean that's basically just where all the, like the costs went to was you pay real money for the tokens, and then you use the company's digital currency for okay. for that. So you do that. And when did you meet her? I met her um, at the. Beginning of July, yeah, at the very beginning of July. Okay, and and still talking to her? Still, yeah. I mean, more just on uh, like Twitter, okay. like just through direct messaging. Um, again, cell phone service doesn't work, so it's like I can't use the the chatting like How that. How much do you think you spent on this? Because it seems kind of pricey. Yeah, 
Nine, uh, Ninety tokens and and five five thousand dollars for for how many tokens? No, no, it's uh, six hundred dollars for for five thousand. For five thousand, yeah. okay. So how much do you think you spent? Um, on this? probably close to like two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, so I'm just going to break in here for one minute, and then I'm going to let you listen to him really just go on and on about this relationship with this webcam girl, Sylvie, who he met just like a couple of months before the murders take place. And during that time, he says that he spent around $200,000 on Sylvie. Um, at, by the end of the trial, I believe they totaled up the grand total was around 275000 but I think that also included the money that Cody had helped him with, with his attorney, okay? Um, so around two seventy five. dollars All right, let me explain something to you about the way that this webcam relationship worked. Um, Sylvie is a Bulgarian model who worked on this website where they create chat rooms. It could be a little bit like OnlyFans, but in these chat rooms, there will be multiple men, like 10 to 15 men in the chat room who have paid to be there and like chat back and forth with Sylvie. Sylvie will be on the cam, like talking to them. She might be doing some like minorly sexual things like undressing or what have you. Um, and they are paying her money to get her to do more stuff. They will They'll um, just input like coins or whatever she's asking for, and they will compete against each other to see who like can get her to be the happiest by giving her, probably by giving her the most money. It could also be like they send gifts to her as well, and she opens them on camera for them, and they're all kind of competing with one another to quote unquote make Sylvie happy. And you will hear a lot more about this as time goes on, and especially when we get to the point, I think it'll be in the next video, where we read a shocking letter that Grant Amato writes to Sylvie and all of the men in this chat room who he has come to consider like his best friends after they are told that he's a fraud. He writes them a letter, and it's quite interesting. But for now, I mean, it's important that you be aware of what kind of situation this is. He's going into a chat room. He's speaking to Sylvie. Some of the money that he's paying is getting him, like, one-on-one -on -one conversations and video sessions with Sylvie, um, and he has to pay for that. I'd say. $200,000? Yeah. And where'd the money come from? Money came from me, uh, my brother, and then my dad. Did they know where the money was going to? They didn't know that it was going to uh, a cam, a cam model. I, I was it? saying that it was going towards my Twitch streaming, uh, like, Beginning like, put, yeah, like advertising, like putting my name out there and that that type of thing. But based on what you're telling me, only so many people make so much money. So just, I think just a few in the country make a bunch of money. Right. So well, that, that was like the, the ultimate goal is to get to that. I was hoping that, I, that the stars would align and then I would be like one of those people. Because I was good at the games and I, you know, I'm a, like a funny, pleasant person on the camera and that type of thing. So, um, yeah, I mean that's, so I guess to like bring it all back with why I was brought to Cornerstone, mm -hmm. uh, it was a mix of all of those things. It's like he felt like, you know, I, um, he felt like... You needed to be grounded? Yeah, yeah. And so then I was there, you know, I spoke to, like, the therapist and psychiatrist and all that stuff. I didn't need any medications for anything. Mm -hmm. They had analyzed it as, this is an isolated event. You've been out of work. You have this PTSD from the whole getting arrested thing, and I mean, the last thing on my record was I think a speeding ticket back when I was at UCF, mm -hmm. and then, you know, just having all of that stuff going on, um, but then, I didn't, they had signed me, they, they had signed me up, I think, to be there for 60 days, mm -hmm. but then I was only there until January 4th, so. Who paid for that? My brother, Cody. What was the cost of that, you know? 15000 It was $15,000. And then I think uh, when I had gotten back, we were going through the process of calling them and seeing if we could get any type of refund. And I think they said that he was going to get refunded three thousand dollars from his fifteen. Sure. Um, but I don't. There's so long. Right, right. But I don't know if that transaction had ever gone through yet. So their final diagnosis of you was what? That I was fine. That you didn't need to be there. Yeah. He Lulu. He is delusional because guess what guys? He's telling us that the hospital said that he's totally fine. Fine, 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 fine. 
that I was I was fine. I told them all about like my living situation and how it had been stressful, and then it got better, and then now it's just stressful again. But they had all just said that it was just this isolated just event. Situational PTSD from right. Yeah, like once you once you can get this legal thing taken care of, which I I don't know if I mentioned, but when we looked online and we saw that all the charges mm -hmm. had been dropped, that was on like November 30th or 31st, the mm -hmm. day before we were going to Japan. Mm -hmm. So, while that was good and everything, um, I still knew that it was still going to be like on your record until you get it expunged. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was still thinking, okay, at least now I can maybe start applying when we get back from Japan. Sure. Um, but, you know, yeah. so I mean... After you get back, you got back on the 15th of December. Of December. You got back. I thought you said you went on the 22nd of right. December. Yeah, that's, 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 when Japan. I, that's when I went to, yeah, it was after Japan. Oh. And it was because when I had gotten back, my, um, my mom and dad were, you know, dealing with a lot of the financial stuff while we were up there. Mm -hmm. And then um, when I got back, that's where my dad started to get really kind of, overbearing and I mean rightfully so I know what I did but it's like with him it was every single day hours a day <laughs> excuse me hours a day he'd come home from work and then he would just talk to me just about the same exact thing over and over and over and over and over again and did, it, he, get, did he get heated he would get heated but he, how about you did you get heated no I mean I was you know I I was always the person in the family where, like, my brother Cody would interrupt my dad when he was talking. Uh, my mom would interject and say, you can't be saying that or whatever. Mm -hmm. But for me, I would just sit there and I would just let my dad talk so that he could say everything that he wanted to say. Um, and then if I saw that it was something that he wanted me to respond to, then I'd respond. But I would never be heated to him, sure. especially if I felt like I was in the wrong. Right. Um, to all this, you think you were in the wrong? I mean, yeah. To I mean, some, some extent? To some extent. You know, uh, spending that amount of money, it's idiotic to do that, you know, especially when you're not making so it. So 200000 Right. When was the last time that you and your dad did have, you know, a heated conversation? Uh, it would be Thursday? Thursday. Uh, because one of his rules was that I wasn't allowed to talk to the woman anymore that I had been talking to. Um, but... So bottom line, his parents finally set a firm boundary. He cannot speak to Sylvie anymore. He cannot spend any more of their money. They're done with it. He needs to move on with his life. I don't even know if they were aware of all of the money that he spent at this point, but he's finally getting some consequences. And unfortunately, like he's willing to do anything to ensure that he can go back to his fantasy world. I guess you could say behind the scenes, my mom would let me talk to her through her cell phone using Twitter. Um, and, you know, she would tell me, like, look, you got to keep it, you have to keep it just basic, because if you say anything or if you entice anything or do anything like that, it might lead her to say something to, like, my dad or something like that. Because, How would she get in touch with him? Because apparently when I was in Cornerstone, my dad told her, because he had, like, hacked my computer or something like that, and then he found everything. The electronics guy like you and your brother? Except he's more of that, like, hacking level, like, able to do all that stuff. So he had found, you know, um, like, just the stuff that was related to her. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, he like, he, like, erased my whole entire computer. He put a password on it. So it's like, even when I came back up until Thursday, like, I wasn't able to go onto my own computer to look at anything. I, he's treating you like a small child. Right. And lies, lies. I believe that Grant is definitely lying about some of this. I don't believe his mom just gave him like cell phones and was like, just, okay, go ahead, go speak to your, you know, $200,000 Sylvie girl, but just don't tell dad. Shh. No, like he had been using up all of their money. Um, I don't believe that's really how this all went down, especially because his mom was also murdered. Like if she was so positive and so willing to provide like anything that he needed. I just don't think things would have gone down in this way. But of course, he's still claiming that he's innocent and someone else did this entirely. Um, so I, I don't know how he's going to account for all of that, but he's claiming that his mom was just like, shh, keep it on the down low. <laughs> Rightfully so. I mean, spending that amount of money, I was acting childish. I, I can kind of get it. But um, so yeah, anyways, on Thursday, he had apparently found out that I was 
speaking to her again. Mm -hmm. And when I came back on the 4th, me, my mom picked me up from the Cornerstone place. And then me and my mom met my dad at California Pizza Grill or Kitchen in Waterford Lakes. Mm -hmm. And he had this list front and back on a piece of paper of all the rules, this is what's going to happen, this is why I'm acting the way that I'm going to act, I'm not going to be dad anymore, I'm going to be Chad. And I basically told him that I'm going to be... I'm going to be present. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to start to try and get jobs now. I told him what my plan was. Um, you know, it wasn't really my intention to continue talking to this woman, but it just kind of happened. Uh -huh. um, and then because there was, like, that emotional connection, I guess you could say, uh, between her and me, like, I, I like, you know, it felt like, like, like a relationship, you know. I didn't want to just stop cold turkey on it. Um... So he had apparently found out, and then one of the, happy. right, and one of the stipulations was that he told me at the dinner was, if you speak to this woman again, you're out of the house. Like, I'm mm -hmm. kicking you out. You can pack up your shit, and then you're off my property. Super quick reminder, friends. Grant still hasn't asked these people why he's been brought in for questioning. Still. I, I don't, I mean... <laughs> How could he possibly think, this looks innocent? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just so weird and how calm and whatever he is about the situation. It would, why isn't he saying, why are you bringing me in here? Did my father call in and say I did something wrong? Like, what's up? Before I give you all this information, like, I should probably know, like, what you're looking for. He still hasn't asked them what's going on. Um, and it's clear that things are falling apart in the home. He is making it all like, oh, no big deal, but my dad said I had to leave. Just my dad, like my brother and my mom were, you know, still cool. They were still cool, they're on my side. Like, they know times are hard, right? And like, if I have to spend $275,000 to like, just make it through, like, they care about me. Not dad, but mom and brother, they got it. You know, he's just making up a story that doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. And then, because of the way that he used to be, he had told me that basically if that happens, that if I ever step back onto his property, that he would kill me. So, you know, on Thursday, um, um, that all happened, and then I was in the process. I was getting all my stuff together. I was piecemealing it out to the car, and then, uh, you know, I had interview on Friday. So I, I had to get my suit out to my car. I was trying to just get all of my necessities as best as I could from, you know, mm -hmm. a lifetime of living inside the house. Sure. And then um, um, my brother was working that night, and I think he was working like one of his long nights, but he ended up getting off early. And then I had met with my brother before he came home, just like in the neighborhood area. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah, yeah. It was just on the, uh, like, the back side of the house, like along, I don't remember what that road's called, but it's like you take the bend where it has those two blinking lights, mm -hmm. and then it's just down that road a okay. ways. Not Fort Christmas. Is it Fort Christmas when you still turn the corner? I think so. I'm not Maybe. sure. I, I think so. Well, it was, yeah, it was just, it was just down that road. Okay. Um... And then I basically brought him up to speed, and he had told me that he was going to do whatever. What time was that, you think? Okay, here we go. This is where Grant is really doing his best to actually address what really happened in the home. He's setting it up to the police like, my dad said he would kill me if I came back on the property. It's, it's insane. Something's wrong with him. And when I talked to my older brother, Cody, about it, he was like, don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of this for you. No matter what, I got your back. He's setting it up he's finally getting to the crux of what he wants to tell all of us what he wants to convince the police of is like he had to leave because his dad was going nuts cody and his mom were going to handle it and he got out of there and he has no idea what happened afterwards and he hasn't asked because <laughs> how does it affect him you know um this is what he wants us to believe this is going to be his story throughout the trial now i don't know if it's changed i'm starting to think it might have changed a little bit because a big part of the upcoming docuseries is that he says we can only find the truth by speaking to sylvie the bulgarian cam model we just need to get her on the phone and probably like give him some minutes so he can spend some time with her and then we'll finally have the truth about this murder 
But let's listen in to what he says here. Uh, God, what time was that? What, what time did you go to, let me back up a second, I apologize. You, Mom, and Dad go to California Pizza Kitchen in Waterford at what time? Oh, that was all the way back on January 4th. Oh, you said Thursday. Oh, that wasn't Thursday. No, no, no. no that, was, that, was, that was when yeah. I had come back from Cornerstone, gotcha. and he was giving me the, the rules. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so do Thursday, then. That, we'll what happened? That. that Thursday that you meet with Cody down the street, this is this past Thursday? Yeah. Okay. Tell me, tell me about that. After you and your dad argued. After me and my dad had argued, and he had told me, you know, this is how it's going to be, and, you know, all that stuff. Okay. Um, this is at the house. This past Thursday. Yeah. Th yeah. Okay. Because this is what now? Saturday? Saturday. So yeah. yeah. Past Thursday, I guess you could still say it. Um, so then, yeah, I spoke with Cody. He told me about all that. He had given me his debit so that, because, I mean, I don't have any money and I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd never been out of the house on my own. Um, and then the last thing that I was told was just that, you know, basically, once again, that he'll take care of it because... This is Cody. This is Cody. What time, what time is this? Approximately. I'd say a little after 10, 10.30ish at night. Thursday night. Thursday night. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, so then after that, I just, like, stayed in that air in the vicinity area mm -hmm. for a number of hours, and then I had remembered over some of the nights when I would work overnight and then I'd be able to come, like, get off early, mm -hmm. that I could, that the Publix on 50, on Colonial, the one that's by the tractor supply. 419, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That that Publix, it's like their guest Wi-Fi is always still active, even when the store closes down. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go there because I have my Surface, um, and I can, you know, check on my emails. I had to pull up the address to my interview because I don't have GPS. Mm -hmm. um, so then I would, like, write all that stuff down. And then um, I was basically just waiting in that parking lot until I had to leave to go to the interview. Um, and then, I mean, that was the last, because, again, it's like no cell phone service. Uh, I mean, email was literally, like, my only form of communication. And then, you know, yeah, I just, I didn't have any, I didn't, you know, I was, I went to the, the double tree because I was like, I can't just stay in my car again all night. Right. Um, and who, how did you pay for that? I paid for it with my with my debit card. With your debit card? Yeah. Because okay. I think there was like the 400 or 300 and something dollars still left on it. Okay. How um, did you get there? The double tree? I think I got there at around 3 or 4 p.m. Yes. Fr Friday. Friday. And then, yeah, and then I was just, I mean, I would, like, go out to my car so I get, like, a bottle of water or something like that, or if I forgot something, you know, just, like, necessity-wise. Um, and then I was just there the whole night. Talk to Cody? Talk to Mom? Talk to No, I, I couldn't talk to anybody because I didn't have... But you had the phone in the room. Oh, yeah, I did have the phone in the room. <laughs> but... Yeah, uh, anybody from the phone room? No, I, just, no I didn't even honestly think about it because I was, I was, like, you know away from a place where I lived for 25 years or sure. something like that. I had never, you know, as embarrassing as it is, I'd never been on my own. Right. The longest period I'd ever been away from anybody is two weeks when we were up in Japan. So, I mean, yeah. But I, you had your brother with you, so. Right, right, so, yeah. So you, you had family sure. with you. But, yeah, I mean, so. Yes, this was very hard for Grant because he's never had to live alone and take care of himself. And so he was a little befuddled and overwhelmed when he went to the hotel and he didn't think about like calling anyone or figuring out what was going on. He just had to focus on himself like he's got to run his own bath tonight. So it was kind of a big deal for him. Um, yeah. OK, his parents have been murdered. His older brother has been murdered and he's at the hotel now with his older brother Cody's credit card. And you can see the police kind of ask about that, like, what did you use to pay for it? Oh, my debit card. I'm pretty sure they already know that Cody's card has been charged for a bunch of stuff that Grant was doing. So they know, like, he had to have been there, I'm guessing, when Cody came. Like, that's one of the reasons why they would have connected that he had to have been there. He couldn't have just, like, left, you know. Um, I do think he says, like, Cody passed him the card or something like that. But it's just... 
it's obvious that Grant was involved on some level in all of this, and it's absolutely maddening the way that he talks about it, like, still, he hasn't asked why they're talking to him, still. Let's try to fast forward and get to the part where he finally does ask, like, what are you, um, what are you bringing me in here for? Oh, wait, he never asks that. <laughs> Guys, he never asks. The police do bring it up to him, though, so let's fast forward. There's something you want to tell us. I can see it in your eyes, I can see it in your body language, and just your, the way you act. Now's the time. Now's the time if there's something you want to get off your chest and give us an explanation of what's bothering you. Now is the exact time to do it. And I, I, I'm giving you that opportunity um, right now to tell me. Some, Something you want to get off your chest. It's there. I can see it in your face. I can see it in your eyes. You're upset about that night. You're upset about it. You're upset about it. You've been that since we've talked to you. I can see there's something's been bothering you. Even though I don't know you from Adam's house, can't you see things in people that something's really bothering this guy? It's not that, you know, I spent a bunch of money I shouldn't have on this girl. So be it. You did. It's over with. Money can be made back. Something's bothering you. I'm just worried about what is all transpiring from this. I, I think at this point right now, to be honest with you, Grant, you know what it is. Um, it's, it's in your eyes. Your, your eyes is, is, is the view to your soul, and it's, it's in your eyes. And So Grant spent the past hour spouting more bullshit, which you can find online, and I may link it below as well, just talking about all the things he did after he left his parents' home, how he kind of like ran into Cody as he was leaving to go to the hotel. Cody gave him his credit card and said, go ahead and use it. Um, and then he drove around doing all these random things, like maybe going to a laundromat, stopping at a gas station. And then he finally made it to the hotel and spent the rest of his time there until he went to his interview in the morning. And then they picked him up shortly after that. He also makes it clear that he never watched TV. He's just not a TV watcher. And the police are asking him about this because it was all over the TV that there was like a murder that had been, that had happened in his home in his parents home um but he's like no i didn't watch any of that <laughs> just no, tv's not my thing i did watch youtube but i guess he was watching back then some kind of i guess he was watching some kind of gaming channel on youtube but he didn't hear anything about the news and so he has no idea what's happening and this is the first time that after another hour of this bs the police officers really um question him and say look we know that something is up here and that you're a part of it I, I knew, we, me and, and Eva knew everything before before um, we asked you the questions. Now's the time to, to come to Jesus, be honest, because you're holding something back. I can see it in your eyes. I, I genuinely don't have anything else that I can say about the night or, you know, the, the periods of time afterwards. Uh, and I, I didn't do anything at the house besides get my stuff together and take it out to my car. I'm not going to look. What's going on? What happened in my neighborhood? I, I, I mean, I didn't search it up on anything, on any of the devices that I have. Did you search it somewhere else? At, uh, Rem rem remember, like I said, I know things that you don't know. Again, the police are just like, hey, is it possible that you searched, like you weren't watching TV, but did you search on your phone or your computer, like what was going on at your house? And Grant's like, no, I don't have anything to do that. And they're like, we actually know like what you were searching. So there's just a lot of bullshit that happens for the rest of this interview. Um, it's clear that the police are aware of a lot of things that just totally mismatch with what Grant just told them. And Grant, when they ask him like, what do you think happened at the house? He's like, I don't know, maybe my dad got really mad and then, I don't know, maybe Cody tried to defend me and shot him. I mean, it's just clear that Grant has an idea of what he wants the police, what he wants all of us to think happened. And he puts it out there and the police are flat out like, that's not what happened. That's not what the crime scene shows us. So something else is going on here, Grant, and you need to be honest with us. Well, of course, Grant isn't honest with them. All right, there's another hour left to this interrogation, but I'm only going to cover short snippets of it in my next video, which will also be all about the online social media presence of Cody and Grant, videos and pictures, and all kinds of comments from his their friends and family about their lives and also about what happened the night of this tragedy. So I hope all of you will join me again tomorrow as we finish up like the very end of this interrogation and we go over new information about Grant and Cody's lives.
Thank you so much for joining me here tonight. See you tomorrow. I can't. I honestly can't remember. And you, and I think you, it was one of the Weshes, but and you saw the story because we've seen the same stories. You've seen the story because there's a thing that will tell me how long of the of the time you spent on that. Right. You saw what happened. Yeah, I was on there for like 20 seconds. Well, well, what was your thoughts when you reviewed that story? I was freaking out, and I like I didn't. I was just like blank. I didn't know what to do. I think that there was something that obviously happened at the house. Tell me what happened. I don't know what happened. I know better. Listen to me. We think something else happened before you left the home that you're either afraid of or embarrassed to talk about. But we need to know exactly what happened because, like Danny said, we can place you there at certain times. And so we need to know what happened before you left that house because you didn't leave with everything being okay.